Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come tonight. God, we give you honor and praise that we get to come out midweek and lift up your name and magnify you. To raise you up in all praise and all honor and glory. No matter what is going on in this week, whatever we've been dealing with, whatever we've gone through, God, we can lay that aside and we can lay it at your feet because you are the author and finisher of our faith. You can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can even ask or think. And by faith, God, we are claiming that. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, tonight as we go into our service, God, I ask that you would bless the kids as they go. Watch over them. Give them a word. Help the teachers to minister effectively the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we give you all glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen and amen. Kids, you are dismissed. You can go out those doors. We got services for uh, 12th grade all the way down to babies. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. That's right. It is past six o'clock. Good evening. Is everybody doing well? I'm just giving them time to get out the door, so I'm stalling. Stalling. Um, well, thanks for coming out to midweek. I hope you guys uh, uh, have enjoyed yourself so far. If you are new, we're kind of ramping this thing back up. We like to take time to pray. We like to take time to eat and fellowship and uh, take a little time for the Word of God. This is kind of a little more low-key service at, on sometimes, uh, some nights. And we're going through the book of Proverbs, so it's a little more of a teaching atmosphere than it is preaching, but I'll probably get all fired up here in a minute and start preaching anyway. So... Um, we are going to finish this up next week. Joe is going to bring this to conclusion, and then I'll be back the week after to start a new study in the book of Luke. We actually like going through books on Wednesday night. One, it keeps the pastors all on the same page, but two, really just to get into the Word of God and go through uh, verse by verse and, and those scriptures, it's very, very valuable. And over the course of time, you'll be amazed at how much uh, ground you cover. So tonight, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 9 pro, uh, primarily. I'm going to go through the entire chapter, and that's very odd in Proverbs because typically Proverbs gives you a quip here and a proverb here, and you kind of jump around. So Proverbs chapter 9 is actually a full thought. Most of you guys know uh, the majority of Proverbs was written by a guy named Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. Uh, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines, so he wasn't that smart, but you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, to have 700 mother-in-laws. Come on, bro. I'm just kidding, moms-in-laws. I love my mother-in-law. Um, Proverbs chapter 9. And we're going to read 1 through 5, and then we're going to pray once more. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn and hear. As for who lacks understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine I have mixed. Let's pray once more. God, we honor your word, and we thank you for it. We ask that you would now bless it. Give us clear understanding. Give me uh, uh, the ability to art articulate the message that you have laid on my heart tonight about wisdom and understanding, God. Lord, uh, there's nothing greater that we can get and nothing greater than we can go after than the, the wisdom. And there is no greater wisdom than the word of God. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. Holy Spirit, be here tonight. Anoint this service. Uh, thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the unity of the brethren and the bond of peace that is evident tonight. Uh, God, I just, I love you. And I thank you. And I, I, I just appreciate the opportunity to do this. So God bless it. We do all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I've got three points tonight. The first point is this, the wise person builds. If you look back at nine, chap, uh, chapter 9, verse 1, it says, the, the uh, wisdom builds her house. Wisdom is often spoken of as a woman. Ladies, you say, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'll, I'm going to explain this in the best way I can. Hold on, Dave. I'm, I'll, 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 all things will become clear. I used to live nine-tenths of a mile back on a dirt road. So I had one set of neighbors when I was growing up. I lived literally in the middle of the woods in Bluntville, Tennessee, okay? I was one of those kids that had a rare growing up in this day and age where my mom would hand me a machete and a book of matches, and she would say, leave, don't come back till 6 o'clock when dinner's ready. And I would go and get in all kinds of trouble and, you know, catch snakes and chop down trees and do all kinds of stupid stuff. So I, I would have friends over sometimes, and we would go and do the same thing. We would go out in the woods. Now, I don't know if you had a, the friends that I had, but you always had that one friend. The one friend that when, they, when, they, when you encountered, see, see, we had a dirt road that ran through a farmer's property, and on both sides of the property were electric fences. 
Some of you already know where I'm going with this. Um, and, and you'd walk up to this electric fence, and that one friend would inevitably be like, touch it. <laughs> or better yet, urinate on it. Yeah. <laughs> you were that guy, weren't you? <laughs> See, if you didn't have that friend, you were that friend. <laughs> so after you did it once, you would think you wouldn't do it ever again. But that's not the case. <laughs> because they would be like, well, I wonder if that does the same thing. you know?" Or they'd hand you a stick and be like, you know, just poke it with a stick. So um, wisdom and folly, that's what we're talking about tonight. Because this is what this passage is really built on. It tells you wisdom, and then it tells you on, in, the, in the same passage about the foolish person, the scoffer, the folly. And what the difference between those two is. And, and we want to make wisdom very hard to attain, but it's not. Common sense is wisdom. When you walk up to an electric fence and it's humming, you don't pee on it. That's wisdom. That's how simple it is. But Folly says, you can't tell me anything. I know more than you. And you get shocked because some people only learn through pain. Moms and dads, this is a very hard lesson for our kids because some kids only learn through pain. Some of you have those kids. We'll get to those in a minute. The wise person builds. Go to uh, Proverbs chapter 14, just a few verses. We're going to stay pr pr primarily in Proverbs for a little while. But it says this. This is in Proverbs chapter 14, and it's 1a. We're not going to read the whole uh, verse just now, but it says this. The wise woman builds her house. The wise woman builds her house. See, the men actually do not build the house. The women do. The women are there and they invest in the house. They, they, they take care of the house. They raise the kids ma the majority of the time. Even if you are a working mom, you are still raising your kids ma the majority of the time. You are building your house. And a, a guy can look at a building and say, well, we could live there. But a woman says, the house is my character. It represents who I am. It's what I put my life into. And she builds the house. Go to Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 31 is about the virtuous wife or the virtuous woman. There's a national ministry called the Proverbs 31 woman. And this is where they get this from. So what I want to do is I want to read a couple passages and just read and then talk and then read and talk. But, but remember, a wise person builds. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10 says this. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. Now listen to this. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. So he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. If you are in a relationship, and you are in a brand new relationship, Austin, there he is. <laughs> they got married Sunday, by the way. Didn't know if you guys knew that. Um, if you're in a new relationship, the, the, the greatest thing that you can develop, the greatest thing that you can build is trust. It is the thing that your whole relationship is built on, trust. And it's built brick, brick by brick over time. But it's also destroyed instantly. If you break trust with someone, it's gone like that. But it takes forever to build. And during the first part of your relationship, during the first part of your marriage, during those first five years, you really are, are developing a language of trust. And, and the thing is, is that when you find a wife, when you find a woman who your whole heart can rest safely in her hands, that's a virtuous woman. Because you, know, you don't worry about what's going on. You don't worry that she's worried about you. You, you are constantly safe with everything you do with a woman who builds her house. She seeks, this is in verse 13, we're just going to keep going. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She likes, she's like uh, the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She's busy. 
She is, she is, she's cooking, she's cleaning, she's doing things, and, and she's providing for her household. There's this Rodney Dangerfield joke that we were telling today that it's an old one, but it's like, my wife told me to take me someplace I've never been before. So I took her to the kitchen. Hey! <laughs> Yeah. She goes to the kitchen. She makes you some pancakes. It's verse 16. She considers a field and buys it. She's confident. She's confident. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. So not only is she confident, she's also resourceful. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her, her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. She doesn't rip people off. Now, I love this one. Her lamp does not go out by night. This is the Old Testament equivalent of she does not run out of gas. Man, it's quiet in here. How many of you guys run out of gas? You? How many of you ladies run out of gas? It's not going to. Okay, we'll keep going. I thought there'd be more. But you see your virtuous wives, your Proverbs 31 women. She stretches out her hand to the distaff which is just like the the wheel, and she holds, her hand holds the spindle. Verse 20, she extends uh, extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hand to the needy. She's a giving person. She has a heart that cares. These are all characteristics of the virtuous woman. Since she, she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes the tapestries for herself, her clothing is fine linen and purple. Purple was very, very, and scarlet was very, very costly. But what it's saying here is that even when a potential calamity may strike, she's not panicked because she's got her house in order. She builds her house. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sits among the elders of the land, she respects her husband. And she supports him. And that's the amazing thing, again, about the, the virtuous wife, woman and the virtuous wife is that, that her husband is known among the elders. That she has a part in ministry or a part in the job or whatever is going on. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in the time to come. Now listen to this one. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Not judgment not discouragement. That means when she talks to her children, the law that comes out of her mouth is actually the law of kindness. Isn't that amazing? Because Will talked about this last week, the power of life and death are in the tongue. You have the power to build and you have the power to destroy. And I always saw this cartoon. It was a, it was a, it was a split cartoon. And it was a kid and the kid was drawing something and the dad walked over to the kid and looked at it and the kid was like six years old and, and he looks at the cartoon and he's like, that's awful. You'll never be an artist. And then the ne- next panel, the same thing, the dad was like, that's amazing. You need to keep going. Now it's a six-year-old drawing a drawing, right? And then this is where the rest of the panel stops, just turns black. But this one, seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, and then got a diploma from an art college. Because our words have the opportunity to build, to bring life, or to destroy. And in her mouth is the law of kindness. Is is this okay? You guys are really quiet. Okay. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and and call her blessed. Her husband also praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. That's the amazing thing about it. You see, when you have a virtuous wife, like I do, pretty much every one of my messages, it goes through the filter of my wife. I can look at this passage and I can see the characteristics of my own wife in every single one of them. She's kind to the needy. She does the things around the house. She's, my, she is, she, her name is Beth. Beth means house. And that is the central character of who she is. She builds the house. I know. She hates when I talk. <laughs> Sorry, honey. I love you. Proverbs 14, verse 1b says this. But the foolish woman pulls it down with her own hands. Just like we have life and death in the tongue, the woman that doesn't build her house can actually pull it down. She can disassemble her own house with her own hands. 
Proverbs 21, verse 9, I'll rattle a couple of these off. Better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than in the house shared with a contentious woman. Remember, this guy had 700 wives. He knows what he's talking about. Better to dwell in the wilderness, in verse 19, than with a contentious and angry woman. Proverbs 9, 13 says this. Now, we just talked about the wise woman. Uh, she builds her house. She sets, a, uh, she sets it on seven pillars. She, she's got meat and wine, and she's set a banquet, people that come in. But look at the difference between the foolish woman. She's clamorous. She is simple and knows nothing. For she sits at the door of her house on a seat by the high place in the city to call those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. What she's saying is, my husband's not home. Come in. Come in. Let me teach you a thing or two. And this is what it says. But he does not know that the dead are there, because she has pulled her own house down, that her guests are in the depths of hell. A foolish woman can make living in the house with her a living... It says it. That's, that's the difference between the wise woman and the foolish woman. A wise person builds. Number two, the wise person loves correction. This is very, very hard for us to hear because nobody really likes correction. Because throughout your upbringing, you've had to go through correction. A lot of correction. Some of us, I had to go through a lot of correction. Being the firstborn, anybody get first, firstborners in here? Yeah, you get all the chores all the discipline, all the correction, it's just awful, right? The young one, the third born, nothing. We always would eat around our table, and then like my, my youngest sister, Laura, she would disappear conveniently, like right when it was time to clean up, every single time. She'd go lock herself in the bathroom. It's like, you're not in there, no, you're hiding. So we'd always have to do it. I know, it's first born problems. Um, but the wise person, lo- I'm sorry, I'm getting off track the wise person loves correction proverbs chapter 9 verse 6 says this forsake foolishness and live and go in the way of understanding he who corrects a scoffer or a fool gets shame for himself and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you rebuke a wise man and he'll love you now what is a scoffer Over and over in Proverbs, it gives us a list of what the scoffer is. And I just took these directly from Proverbs that say, this is what a a scoffer will do this. So it says this, and I think they're up here, yeah. A scoffer will not receive wisdom. They will not receive it. They think they already know everything. You can't tell them anything. Doesn't listen to a rebuke. Now, here's what a rebuke is. It is identifying a behavior that does not conform to the will, the way, or the word of God. That's what a rebuke is. It is identifying a behavior that does not conform to the will, the way, or the word of God. And going to someone in love and saying, hey, your life does not line up with what I'm reading here. You need to change something about that. And that is very hard. A fool will not receive that. But a wise person, you rebuke a wise person and they will love you for it. Because the reason you're rebuking someone is because you love them. Not because you hate them, not because you're causing them harm, it's because you want to see them do well. And a wise person recognizes that, but a fool doesn't. A fool, a scoffer, will never find wisdom. They will never find wisdom. And it's one of those things that's very, very hard, because if you know somebody and love somebody, and you know that they are a scoffer, you know this is the result. They're not going to find wisdom unless something changes. They don't love correction. They're a sorrow to his or her parents. They're proud and haughty. They are actually a source of contention. And then peace will come to the situation when you remove the fool. It says when you remove the scoffer, peace comes. Have you ever been in a board meeting or in a meeting with somebody in a team of people and, and, and there's one dude or one woman and you remove that element and it's like the whole thing just calmed down. Well, imagine that. Isn't it amazing that the Bible, 3,500 years ago, is teaching us the same stuff that we need to know on a job? Hey, boss, if we would just fire that joker, life would be so much easier. (laughs) 
just make sure they're not talking about you. Okay. Give instruction, verse 9, give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wise, or teach a just man, and his learning will increase. Proverbs 1.5, a wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain counsel. Number three, a wise person seeks God. Now, in this passage, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it says this over and over in the Bible. It says it in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It says it in Psalms. There's a couple places in the Bible that says the exact same. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, let me explain this to you because this is where I get a little excited. When... Um, I think we had just gotten married. I think it was uh, 1999 or 2000. And I got a job at this place called Rainbow Graphics. And it was the most boring job I've ever worked at in my entire life. I sat in front of a computer, and they handed me a stack of papers, and I had to, to do corrections. And it was all left brain thinking. Like, I didn't even have to read. I didn't do, it was one of those just automatic jobs where you're not doing, you're, you're basically, it's got to move over six picas, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, that's moved over. That's it. Like it was just over and over every day. When you got done with that stack, there'd be two more stacks. And I did this for three years. And then I stumbled upon a guy named Chuck Missler. And Missler began to, he did this thing called 24 hours through the Bible. And he had a study that took you 24 hours through the Bible. It's pretty literal, you know. And I started listening to that guy. And the fear of the Lord began the knowledge. Because what happened was, it unlocked something in me. I no longer came to church because my parents made me come to church. I came to church because God became my God. And there are some of you in here that have gone to church maybe 30 or 40 years. Or there's some of you in here that are just now starting out this, this journey with, with, with God and you don't understand that this is the infallible word of God. It's not a book of stories. It's not something you put on the shelf next to Harry Potter and the Quran. It is something that is so supernatural that there is no other book on the planet like it. This book has over 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ alone. No other book in history has a pro pro prophetic prophecy about it. A predictive prophecy that actually has come true. None. Not one single book. And yet, you can take only eight of those, and the odds of one man fulfilling those eight, just eight prophecies, is ten to the seventeenth power. That's a big number. You fill the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep, you get into a helicopter, you put a blindfold on, they fly you to the center of Texas, and they drop a silver dollar marked on one side with something. You walk in from the Arkansas border and in one try pick up that silver dollar. That's the odds of fulfilling eight prophecies. He fulfilled 333. You, if you do not realize... And you have never asked God to reveal anything in this book directly to you. Then this is a, a loving rebuke. You're missing it. You are missing one of the greatest experiences of your Christian life. Because you do not grasp the power of the word of God. We did a series of courses in September and October. And I did the Old Testament survey. And the very first message was called, it was an apologetics message, and that simply means a defense of faith. Not an apology for faith, but a defense of faith. And I go through and I tell you how we got our Bible, the archaeological evidence, the scientific evidence, the prophetic evidence of this. In two weeks, we're going to talk about Joshua and the Battle of Jericho, and I don't want to give everything away. But, Joshua, but Jericho, the city of Jericho, the inner walls were about nine acres. The outer walls were a little bit bigger, they're about 12 acres. You could walk around the city of Jericho by about, if you started at 7, by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They, they walked around seven times in one day. They could, they could do that by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Archaeological evidence shows that all of the walls in Jericho were outward. Now, when you're attacking a walled city and you've got to go up and over, which way do the walls fall? No. See, the walls of Jericho, it was like a hand came from heaven and went, and they all blew outward. 
And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. It didn't have nothing to do with ram's horns and marching and the, the, the uh, earthquake and the micro earthquakes, that the, the stomping soldiers. No, 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 no. God blew the walls down. What about Jonah and the whale? I mean, he was. You, you, you got to understand something. If you either receive this by faith or you don't receive it, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he comes to, who comes to God must believe, first off, that he's just God. That he is. You have to believe that he is the supreme God. That everything about him is miraculous. That he can do anything he wants at any time he wants. I'll tell you a real quick funny story. This happened to me today. We're getting ready to replace this stage. We've been looking at something that's an easier setup, an easier teardown. So I talked to Will and I said, hey, I think, can we just give this one away to like a ministry that needs it? So I called a couple people and they're like, no, I don't think we need a stage that size. No, 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 no. So I called a guy named Stephen McKay who is uh, part of our missions team and he does the stuff in Africa. I called him and he had literally walked off the stage where he was preaching a revival in Florida at two o'clock in the afternoon. And I said, hey, do you need a stage? And he starts laughing. I need a stage. I said, is, are you just repeating what I said, or do you really need a stage? I need a stage, Rick. I need a stage. Are you kidding me? You're giving me a stage? How much do you want for it? I was like, e Stephen, come on. The guy, <laughs> who needs a stage? But he's like, I've been praying for a stage for about two weeks now. We had a missions team that came in. And they said, we'll build you a stage. He said, no, God will provide. I, we'll figure it out. He's like, two weeks to the day, you call me and you say, do you need a stage? Yes, I need a stage, Rick. You see, it's funny because you get into that vein and you begin to see God move and work and you, you realize it's the same God. It's the same God that parts waters. It's the same God that blows cities outwards. It's the same God. And that if you realize that and put your faith in that, then the beginning of your wisdom begins to come because fear, awe, oh, reverence, holiness takes hold. And you say, give me more. Because he wants you to get into his word. Listen to what James chapter 1 verse 5 says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given. <laughs> Have you ever even asked God for wisdom? Have you ever even sat down with your Bible, opened it up and said, okay, God. For the next 30 minutes, I want you to open these scriptures up to me like I have never seen them before. Give me wisdom. And James chapter 1 verse 5 says, I will give you wisdom without reproach, liberally, pressed down, shaken together. All you have to do is ask. And yet we don't take the time to even ask. We read our chapter, close the book, and go on with our day. And yet this is what he says. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 through 12. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, your days will be multiplied, and the years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you're wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Without me, you have no wisdom, and without me, you are totally isolated in your foolishness. Because I am wisdom. I'm going to end with this. Solomon, the guy that wrote these Proverbs, was a very depressed dude. If you read Ecclesiastes, don't do it in a bad mood or, or being depressed because you'll just get even more depressed. This is how he ends Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is all man can do. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He says, listen, I have had houses. I have had women. I have had wine. I have had more money than I know what to do with. And it's all vanity. Every, it's all vanity. Nothing under the sun satisfies. 
That's what he's saying. The wisest man in the Old Testament. That was his achievement of wisdom. That's where he got. Fear God, keep his commandments. That's all I can tell you. The end. Thanks, Solomon, for the pick-me-up. But here's the thing, saints. You've been given Jesus Christ. And you don't even realize what you have. When, when he stood before Pilate, Pilate says, what is truth? And Jesus said, I am truth. Not I am the truth. I am truth, wisdom, understanding, knowledge encapsulated. When Paul was chained to a wall in Rome in the Mamertine prison, he's chained to a, he doesn't have a seat, he doesn't have a bed, he has a chain and a stone wall. And when he asked his friends to bring, he said, bring me parchment and a cloak because I'm freezing and I want to write something down. That's what he asked for. He's chained to a wall and he begins to write this letter and it is the most uplifting, encouraging, happy letter he's ever written, the book of Philippians. And in it, you read these words. I know how to be happy when I have a lot. And I know how to be happy when I have a little. Because I found the secret of wisdom. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, he realized what Solomon totally missed. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And listen to this. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. What that is saying is there is a light and a joy and a wisdom in Jesus Christ. That Solomon in all of his wisdom didn't even have access to. And yet you, sitting in chairs and in pews every Sunday morning, have access to the fully revealed gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is wisdom. Let him who is wise be wiser still. Amen? We have more wisdom in this book than the wisest man that has ever lived. And that should make you jump for joy. Amen. Bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for the word. God, I just ask that you would light a hunger in our church for the word of God. In the beginning was the word. <laughs> and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus Christ is the word. He is all wisdom. He is all truth. He is all understanding and knowledge. And even in the rebuking, even in the correction, God, we should find comfort because those he loves, he corrects. God, I just ask that you would help us. The next time we open our Bibles and we set aside time to spend with you, let us first ask for wisdom. Let us first ask for understanding. Let us first ask to reveal through the Holy Spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit, what is in the Word of God. Give us a greater understanding of who you are, a greater depth of the Word of God. That we would begin to develop words in season and out. And as we come together on Wednesdays and Sundays, we would grab each other and we say, let me show you what God has been speaking to me this week through His Word. It is life-changing. It has absolutely changed my life. It's not another movie. It's not another self-help book. It's not another course I've taken. It's the Word of God. And it has radically changed my life like nothing else has. Because in it is life. Lord, help us to realize that what we have is more precious than rubies. It's more precious than gold. It's more precious than silver. It's more precious than anything we can attain on our own. Let us never take for granted the glorious word of God. 
Lord, I love you, and I thank you, and I praise you. Now seal this word in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You got to stand with us. Search my heart in the deepest part from beginning to the end. like Jericho come and tear down my walls and I am in your hands you are the promised land you are the king of my heart and to you my eyes are is we will you help me see that you are all that I need yes Jesus you are all that I need so God give me a heart of ever after you Ever after 
Amen. Well, let's pray and we will dismiss and go get our kids. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to get into your word. And God, I hope this um, is sealed in the hearts and the ears of us tonight to where we get a revised and a revitalized view of your word, how precious it is, how important it is. So God, help us to build, help us to receive correction, and help us to seek after you in all that we do. God, I ask now that you would help us go be salt and light, be the light of the world. Give each of us an opportunity to share your gospel, your glorious gospel, with the people around us this week. We do this all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You guys are dismissed. Thank you for coming. Hopefully we'll see you Sunday.